joining us today on our show is a uh, author of Rise of the Warriors, Mark Esch. Coach, introduce yourself to our audience. Hello, my name is Mark Esch. Uh, um, live in Savage, Minnesota. Married, have three daughters, and uh, coached football for about twenty years now. So uh, I'm happy to be a part of this podcast, and uh, hopefully everybody had a great Christmas. Coach, you just kind of alluded to it a little bit. You wrote Rise of the Warriors, but before that, uh, you were a coach at Mankato West, uh, Prior Lake, and most recently Minnetonka. Tell us about what got you into coaching. Well, if you go way back to my days at Caledonia, I'm a Caledonia alum, graduated in 1995. And uh, for me, going through the program, I was always one of those kids, and we'll talk about the culture at that time a little bit later. I was one of those kids that just wanted to work hard and be the best football player that I could. When I got out and attended the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse, I learned a lot of things that really would have helped me become a better football player back in high school. I don't, I really don't feel like I peaked as a football player until I was like 21, 22 years old, and alert, learned a lot of strength and conditioning stuff, nutrition stuff. So my motivation to get back in was to give kids the experience that I didn't have necessarily, and that's the way I started. That was the purpose when I started was to give back to the kids make sure they maximize their experience. That's evolved through the years, and, and I'm sure I'll get into that as we, as we move along. But, uh, and, then, and then the head coach at UW Lacrosse, when he retired, Roger Herring, who's actually in the NC2A Hall of Fame, he, uh, he encouraged me to be a student assistant at UW Lacrosse, and that's where the journey began. Now, what drew you to writing a book? Now, um, obviously, Caledonia has a place that's special in your heart, but what drew you to write a book and try to share that message with others? So as part of, you know, what I was just describing, when I, when I left Caledonia, went to UW Lacrosse. Lacrosse is about you know, a 20-minute drive from Caledonia. So I keep in touch with Carl Frickty, the current head coach. He was an assistant. He was actually my ninth grade football coach when I went through the program. And uh, strength, current strength coach Ernie Hodges kept in touch with him. So I'd go back in the summers, get my workouts in at their weight room. I'd always stay connected. So I became good friends with Ernie and Carl through the years. Carl, he was in my wedding. We became such good friends. We'd hang out. He'd come across, and we'd talk football and philosophy. You know, I was in my early 20s or 20 years old, and he was about 30 years old, a brand-new coach. So I kind of watched the evolution take place uh, from the previous culture, which we're going to get into here in, in a few minutes, to what it is now, which when you talk about cultures – I don't know if there is a better culture in the state of Minnesota or maybe in the entire nation. It's, uh, it's amazing the, what's been created there. So what drew me to Caledonia was that change that occurred, uh, starting uh, with Mark Frailing in the early 90s and Carl Frichty taking over in the fall of 1997. And then you fast forward through the next 23 years, uh, they produced two U United States Navy SEALs. They produced two NFL football players, a couple uh, state championship football coaches, and guys who are coming out of the program. And this is probably the most important thing. They're not just winning games. They're coming out of the program as champions in life, and they're succeeding in their fields. They're, they're champion fathers and husbands and all those types of things. So that's what really uh, appealed to me. Coach, when you talk about culture with Coach Fricky, we had Coach Fricky on in our first season of the podcast. And when you talk culture and you talk uh, all the things that he does really well, that was very evident in the 45 minutes or so we had him on. The guy was a phenomenal guy to have on our show. Um, but when you, when you started looking at Caledonia, what stood out to you right away in terms of how they conducted their program, maybe from when you were a player to then as you started to see the transition with Coach Fricky? Well, that's a great question, and, uh, you know, I can probably fill in the gaps where uh, Coach Frickty was too humble to, <laughs> to talk about some of the things that, that take place and that he's done there. Um, the, the number one quality that sticks out to me, once again, we gotta, we'll get to the point where I describe what the culture was like prior to, uh, you know, Mark Friendly and, and Carl Frickty, but the number one quality that sticks out to me with Caledonia is humility. and along with that brotherhood. They've created such a, a loving community. I think as men, sometimes we don't want to talk about love, um, but those guys love each other. Carl loves those kids. He's like another father, father to them. He's like, he's like an older brother kind of thing to me. 
And uh, the number one thing that sticks out in, in any great program, I feel like, from my years is humility. You can't grow and develop as the coach or as a program if you're not humble. And humility is one of those things where if you admit that you're humble, you're probably not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I think humility is one of the things I'm always grasping for and trying to hold, get a hold of because we all, and if you're brutally honest with yourself as coaches, there's those times when your kid, if you're coaching position or if you're a head coach or you're an offensive coordinator and you do something really well, your, your ego starts to rise up and you really have to battle with humility sometimes. And, um, you know, it, it, even if you don't let that out, it's always an internal, in, internal struggle. So to answer your question, uh, John, the number one quality that I noticed throughout the entire Caledonia culture is humility. Now, are all 50 kids that are on the varsity roster humble? No, but they're taught about humility, and that's what Carl Fricke does so well. And your book, Rise of the Warriors, really focuses on that change in culture that we talked about before. So kind of going back from the beginning, what was that culture like before this cultural shift took place? You know, I don't think there's a story in Caledonia if you don't talk about what it was like in the 80s and early 90s. Now, if you go back to the true history of Caledonia, and this isn't even in the book, in the 70s, a man named Felix Prococo led them to a state championship in, I believe it was 76. And they were undefeated in the year before as well and probably had a great culture at that time. I don't know. I didn't go back that far back in my interviews. But when Felix Prococo left, you know, it, it led to a tumultuous time in the Caledonia football program and for the school. So for, for me and my older brother and for Carl Frichty and his brothers that went through and some other guys that I interviewed in the book, you know, the recurring theme, I wanted to make sure it wasn't just me who was experiencing this. Like I was the one causing all these issues. So I wanted to go back and verify through interviewing people who went through the 80s and 90s. You know, it was a culture of drinking. Most, most people drank every weekend. It was a party school. Um, most people smoke cigarettes, smoke marijuana. Not most people, but a lot of the, like the football culture, like we, we want to call them maybe alpha males. I don't know if that's the best word, but, uh, you know, the aggressive or assertive male that has that energy they need to get rid of and is drawn to football. So marijuana, smoking cigarettes, tobacco, womanizing, hazing, hazing was prevalent, bullying. Like I state in the book, I was both a bully and bullied because that's what you had to do in order to get through school, it seemed like. Either that or go in a corner and hope nobody notices you. You know, you'd walk down the hall and the older kids would spill your books all over the floor. It was a seven through 12 school, it still is. Um, they'd slam you against lockers. They'd do all types of that type of stuff in the locker room and there were fights, you know. There were guys who were known as fighters and that's what they did. So it was a tough, community you know people weren't being shot and killed uh it wasn't that bad of course but it, it wasn't a great uh culture to grow up in so the story now uh tracks that when mark frailing came in and started to you know kind of put a put his foot down so to speak and start to teach character intentionally and then carl fricky took that to the next level coach Kind of to back check just a, just a little bit. Um, when Coach Fraley came in and started to change that a little bit, did you notice that? I mean, I mean, what were some of the things that you saw? Being, I mean, you were in school when he took over. You know, Coach Frick is saying, what, what are some of the things that you saw right away that led you to believe, you know what, this thing's going to get better? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Well, you know, first for a few years, you know, my brother was a junior and a senior under Coach Fraley, and so – I would go and watch, you know, of course, all of his games. I was in the bleachers. I was dreaming about being on the field. He was a wide receiver. I was going to be a running back. He was four years older than me, so, you know, he was quite a bit older as far as football age. So Mark Fraley came in, and he thought, and Mark admits to this, and this is in the book, uh, he thought I, he'd just say, you know, drinking is bad for you, so don't do it. And I think a lot of us as coaches, we think if we just say something is wrong, and they shouldn't, the kids shouldn't do it, they're just not going to do it. Well, that's, that's totally false. Um, kids aren't just going to say, oh, this is bad for me. That's right. It, 
I'm not going to do it anymore. They need way more than that to change a culture. So the first few years, Mark Frailing and his staff really spun their wheels. And then I think it was my senior year, or I know it was my senior year, uh, junior and senior year, they put in a program called Lift. It was a leading into the future together thing. And um, in order to be a captain, you had to sign a pledge that you were going to be um, – substance free and you couldn't be a captain if you didn't sign this thing and you had to be invited and then they started teaching character so character meaning he would read read a book during practice and this is all in rise of the warriors of course but mark fraley made it intentional to start teaching character so it was right in the middle of practice and this might sound crazy even to you guys we would sit on the grass with our pads on you know we'd take our helmets off we'd relax for about 10 minutes and Coach Frailing would get up there in the middle of practice during break time and read a book. It was The Right Kind of Heroes by a man named Bob Shannon, and it was from based on the East St. Louis football program and their culture change. So he started in teaching intentionally. So then he left after the 90, fall of 96, and Carl Fricke took over in 97. And I can tell you exactly what these guys do to teach character and to change the culture. I can't give you all the details. To do that, you have to read the story. I mean, I can't condense 150 pages into one minute or one statement. But they started teaching character. So they started saying, these are the six, seven, eight things that we stand for. And we're going to teach you about them every day. And so I call it preaching, but they're going to share stories from their personal life. How many of you guys played football? How cool is it when the coach you played for and you're kind of intimidated by, you really look up to, they're sharing stories about their life, about their struggles and things they overcame. And then they started drawing from books and other, other stories from different areas of life that they could share with the team and uh and teach character teach about those six seven eight things that they stood for so i relate it just like your running game you have three or four run concepts that you're going to work hard at and get better at you're going to rep them probably thousands of times over the course of a year what are those character traits that you want your team to stand for you need to identify those and teach them and get hundreds or thousands of reps of kids getting that into their brain so it becomes part of who they are. And then you need to go out and role model it. You know, it doesn't stop just teaching. you got to role model it. And the last thing, guys, and I'll wrap this up, this question, but in order to do this effectively, you have to have the right balance of relationship and accountability. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of coaches that have great relationships with their players, but when they see something that doesn't line up with their character values, they're not going to hold the team accountable or that player accountable. They might be a person of high character and integrity, but if they're not holding the players accountable when something goes wrong, there's never going to be that balance. The kids are never going to implement it. There's the other coaches who hold everybody accountable. We all remember a coach we probably had like this. They have no relationship. They're just getting on your case constantly. You don't feel like they care about you, uh, that type of thing. And that's the balance that Carl Fricke has, has perfected. Uh, if you watch him coach, he's holding kids accountable, sometimes very loudly. Uh, and then he has the relationship to back that up. So when he gets on a kid, the kid knows, hey, this guy cares about me. That's why he's getting on me. He's going to be joking around with me, you know, after practice and pat me on the butt and loving me up. I know why he's getting on me right now and holding me accountable. So those are kind of the characteristics of, of what triggered the change and how they maintain it. Now, in your opinion, Mark, when you look at all the success that Caledonia has had over the past decade, do you think culture is the main ingredient behind it? I think without a doubt. doubt I think, you know, culture is king, in my opinion. Um, talent is like a prince. You, you, you can't win without talent. So if, if ever, your entire team's running a 5 5 40 yard dash and you have the best culture in the world and you're holding kids accountable and you have great relationships, you're just not going to win. Um, and that's okay because you have to define what success is. Um, to Carl Frichty, success is when the kids leave his program, they're going to be uh, tougher kids for having been through the program. They're going to learn the life skills, and they're going to go apply that to their job and become the best person they can in their job with their family as a parent and a husband. So 
I, I truly believe that culture is the number one thing that defines any unit, whether it's a team or a family. I mean, you know, what's your family culture? What's your, uh, what's your team culture? What's your business culture? But I think these principles apply to really anywhere in life. So to answer your question, Brian, absolutely. Culture is the number one thing. Now you throw in the talent and you throw in the King Brothers, which they've had. Um, and, and some of these other kids, cause it, the King brothers overshadow a lot of the other talent that they've had. It's, it's no doubt when you combine talent with character, you're going to be successful in the win loss column. And I think there's so many teams out there that when the talent comes along, their character isn't aligned necessarily and they lose it. They, they lose their grasp on it. Or sometimes you might not quite have the talent. It might not be that. As you might not be as talented as the team you're playing, but your character and your culture win the football game for you. And uh, Pete Carroll says, you know, two teams of equal talent play, the team with the greatest, um, highest character will win. And I go a step beyond that. I think with the greatest culture, you can even beat teams that may be more talented than you because of what you've built. So I think the number one, absolutely, I agree with that question, Brian. Number one is culture. Mark, what are some keys to building that culture that you just alluded to, um, especially when you take away the time you spent at Caledonia as a player and then obviously the book and stuff like that? Um, what are some things that, that are consistent with winning and culture, and how do you build that? Because a lot of people that are going to listen to this are going to say, well, that's great. You know, culture's great, but how do we get from A to B here? Right. So in the, in the book, in the second part of the book, first part of the book, just to let, let our listeners know, I talk about the history and there's lessons that you can take away from um, learning about what the culture was like in the eighties. And then what happened started with Mark Fraley and I kind of give more detail. I throw some personal experience in there just cause that's obviously what I know. And then I take it up to the point where uh, Caledonia wins their uh, second state championship. And then I give an overview. So there's a history there. And then the second part of the book are the attributes that make Caledonia football great. So when you read this book, yeah, read the history, know how bad it was, give yourself hope if you're in a similar situation that things can change. Understand it took 10 years of Carl, Mark Frailing first, and then 10 years of just Carl Frickie as head coach to win their first state championship. So you're looking at 15 to 17 years there before they win their first state championship because the culture was super bad. Um, so I'm just going to fly through these eight qualities and um, these eight attributes in order to get the in, in depth and what you're talking about, John, how do I do it? Um, I won't be able to touch on all those right now, but if you go through the book with a highlighter and a pen, they're in there, they're in there. And I even have questions after each uh, attribute to help kind of trigger some thought process. So the first one, and I think this is imperative and we hear this all the time, is know why you are here. Know why you're coaching football. And not just yourself, you need to share this with, with your team. And I think a lot of times a coach will say, this is what I stand for, this is why I coach, I want a development of character, all this stuff. But if you're not sharing that with your team and then role modeling it and creating the relationship and the account of holding the kids accountable, those are two big themes that I'm always gonna come back to. You gotta have the relationship, you gotta hold the kids accountable and then share with them why you're here and why this is making a difference. And then talk about why you want them to be a better person down the road and share the life lessons as, as they go through them. Hey, this is gonna help you in life. That difficult conversation about playing time, that's gonna help you in life. So constantly looking for life lessons to share and teach the kids and share your why with the kids. And then number two, and I'm gonna fly through these eight, is uh, develop a no quit attitude. And I kind of use a play on words when I, this chapter in the book because I've watched California play a lot because we went to the same scrimmage out in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, South Dakota at Augustana. And so one thing that I observed with Caledonia is what I call you will quit before we do. We guarantee it. And that's a quality in Caledonia. And that's something that has to be talked about over and over and over again. And what I say preached about. And when you know your why and the kids know their why, that no quit attitude comes into play. And then you're gonna start the footings of that great culture. 
And then the third one is get uncomfortable, do hard things, be uncommon is what Carl Fricke talks about. So, you know, explaining to the kids why they want to get up and be to the high school at 630 or be there every day after school, sharing stories of success. The recurring theme, guys, in one of the, one of the books that really influenced me in my life, it's called Legacy. And it's about the all black rugby team in New Zealand, one of the most successful franchises in sport history. And the one, the one recurring theme that you're hearing me talk about is sharing stories builds character. So stories from books, stories from podcasts, um, stories you hear on you know, YouTube, showing YouTube videos and then talking through them, sharing life experiences, get uncomfortable. The next one is humility, sacrifice, and service. The number one quality in a leader is humility. You have to model that yourself. You have to talk about it with the kids. Once again, you have to share stories. You have to put them in positions where they're sacrificing and serving others. You have to tell them why the person next to them is more important than they are when it comes to football. And they're going to give of themselves. Once again, I'm just skimming through these. The next one is dream big. Plant the seeds of a state championship in their head. Plant the seeds of being an NFL football player in their heads. You know, he Carl did that with the appropriate person, Carl Kluge. He planted a seed that, hey, you can get to the NFL. You don't do that with every kid, but you, you give them a vision of, hey, you, you can go from an average football player to a good football player if you, if you work hard here. The next one is work, work harder on yourself than you do anybody else by reading those books, uh, listening to podcasts like this, uh, putting the good information in your brain so that comes out. What I say in the book, it's random access memory. So you can share that with your team. You can share stories. One of the books that really influenced me was The Traveler's Gift by Andy Andrews. And I could take stories out of there and share them with my kids at Mankato West. And that helps develop that bond. Um, the next one is Building the Brotherhood. And I expand on this in the book as well. But Building Brotherhood through hard work, um, determination, sacrifice, service, all those types of things things is what builds the brotherhood and there's there's what Cal, uh, Carl Frichty believes in the book there's what Carl Frichty believes built the brotherhood and then the eighth one is use these things in life and I think you constantly need to be reminding your kids that you're gonna use these experiences in life to be a better husband to be a better father to be a better coach to be a better professional or business person down the road and so I share some stories about that in the book as well so once again, just a quick overview of those eight things. But to answer your question, John, uh, I think if, if you dig into that book and you really read it, highlight and, and say this applies to our team or this applies to our business, you're going to see the how to come out. And especially when you know your why, I think the, um, the how becomes less important when you know what your why is. And that's what drives you every single day. When we look at the impact of the football team and the success the football team has had on the community of Caledonia, how would you describe that positive impact it's had on the school and the community? That's a, another great question. So um, first of all, it started with the football program. They made the changes. They started teaching the character. And then just because of, you guys know this, your football players, when you build a great culture, they're just naturally leaders. Uh, they're going to lead the school. And, I, uh, you know, I, I hope our administrators know this. A strong football team, and I shared this with some other people, and, and they totally agree, but a strong football program with a culture of character who's consistently successful. Now, you might not win 68 games in a row like Caledonia, but consistently successful in the win-loss column because you're teaching character, it's going to spill out into the entire school. So Caledonia spilled into the hallways. Then it affected the girls' basketball team, the boys' basketball team, the baseball team. It affected really every other form of athletics and activities. And then it got into the classroom at that same time. So Caledonia, I don't know where they were when I was there. Now I believe they're the 16th best school in the state of Minnesota as far as academics. And that's a small town of 3,000. Usually when you look at the top 30, they're all city schools or, or you know, populations of 20,000 or above, you know, Caledonia is a city of 3,000. So it's spilled into the school academically as well. And then it spills into the community where the community now knows, I share a story at the end of the book where I was paying my parking fees after uh, watching the state championship at U.S. Bank Stadium. And there's these five people in front of me 
and they're 50 to 80 years old, and they're talking about the character that the Kelderney coaches teach their kids. They didn't know I was listening. They didn't know their story was going to be in my book. But um, that spilled into the community. So now as a mom or dad, I know if I teach these things and my kid plays football or other athletics, it's going to be backed up. So when you get great parents who are teaching character and you get great coaches who are teaching character, I, I feel like that's unstoppable. And that's what's taking place in the Caledonia community. And this has just been the last 14 years. If Carl Crick, Frickty coaches in another 10 to 20 years, it's just it's, it's going to be crazy what that town is like as far as, as champions in the community and, and all that type of thing. So it's definitely spilled into other areas. Coach, in, in your opinion, the cultural shift and the, and the subsequent success that Caledonia has had and Underdoon continues to have, obviously, is that, you know, is that replicable in other communities or programs? I mean, I, and I don't know if our listeners, I'm sure a lot of them know, but you had a great run at Mankato West and you've had a ton of success as a football coach. I mean, do, do you just take the Caledonia model and, and mimic it? Or do you say, you know what, this is what works for Caledonia. You know, I need to kind of develop you know take that foundation and then develop my own kind of brand or own concepts that work for my school right i don't think it's a cookie cutter approach uh you can't just go in if, if you if you're motivated by this and you read the book and then you call carl frickty and you meet up with him and sit down with him and talk which you'll do um you're gonna leave things exactly how kelly has done them put your own distance um like when you go to a football clinic, you, you watch somebody teach on the whiteboard and you're like, I can do that, that I'm going to leave out, but this will apply to my kid. I can use that as far as a scheme or whatever. It's the same thing here. You got to put your own personal touch on it. And it, it, if, if you read the book and talk to Carl Frickty, are you going to win 68 games in a row? I can't make that promise. No, probably not. <laughs> you're probably not going to do that. Um, but like you mentioned, John, at Mankato West, we won a couple state championships. I did model uh, a lot of what Carl Frickty did um, because we stayed in touch so much. It was, we were sharing ideas and it, it's a little different school. Now, you know, at, at Mankato West, there's 1200 kids in California, there's 200 kids. So it's a little bit, I don't, I don't always walk through the hallway and see a football player like Carl Frickty does. Um, you know, now I'm at Minnetonka as an assistant coach and there's 3,000 plus kids. You don't just walk through the hallway. and It's not the same as Caledonia. You have to take those principles and, um, and the guidelines that you get from the book and from uh, listening to Coach Frickty, and you have to apply them to your situation. And then I think you, won't, you can't help but increase the level of your program. Uh, so I think if you apply them and you role model what I'm talking about and you have good people around you that buy in and you can withstand the storm. Carl Frickie talks about that all the time. He was doing an interview. We did a book signing and he was doing an interview. And one of the first things he said, well, you got to have thick skin because at first people did not like Carl. They said he was one, one man, business leader. I don't know his name. Um, said that Carl Frickie was the worst hire ever. <laughs> and he has since uh, uh, humbled himself and apologized for that and, and said I was wrong. But, um, you know, you, you definitely have to take this. You got you to gotta not quit. That's quality number two. You have to apply it. You have to stick to it. And then you're going to see growth in your program. And I think you can turn your program into a consistent winner with these principles. I have no doubt, in fact. No, as we wrap a few things up here, Coach, first of all, again, thank you for coming on and speaking with us. We really enjoy the, the message that you're sending to coaches and hopefully giving them some inspiration to turn around their own cultures. But for people looking to find your book and looking to find some more stuff about Rise of the Warriors, where can they find out um, and, and purchase the book and these materials? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm going to share that in one second. One thing I want to add in, if you don't mind, is the purpose behind the book. I want, I want this country – and hopefully this country, and hopefully it spreads beyond Minnesota, to see that football is a safe game. Um, you look back at 23-plus years in Caledonia, nobody's permanently disabled. No one is suffering from, uh, you know, the CTE stuff, the concussion stuff. Uh, uh, high school football is safer than it's ever been. We've benefited from 
the NFL and the college rule changes more than anybody. So our game is played at a, a slower speed. When you look at the NFL, those guys are just flying around. So to a mom or dad out there who's considering, should my son play football? I think the benefits far outweigh the, the risks. Um, you know, even in my years at Mankato, all the years I coach, I don't know of anybody who's, you know, has permanent disability or even regrets playing high school football. And that's probably hundreds or thousands of kids. So I want it to be positive. I want people to understand uh, what, what went on behind the scenes in Caledonia because a lot of people look at uh, the win streak and the 10 state championships in the last 14 years and think, wow, you know, um, must be great. They got it on cruise control. They get all the athletes. I feel like this can be duplicated. Maybe like we talked about, not to the level that Caledonia is doing it, but it can be, you can change your culture. So I want to make sure those points get, uh, get out there as far as why I wrote the book. I want it to change how football is looked upon across the nation. And then one other quick story. When football, tackle football was taken away from my class when I was in sixth grade, and I, I described this in the book, um, we, were, we were labeled the worst class ever to go through Caledonia, and I was part of that. And they took tackle football. We played tackle football our entire elementary school careers. It was taken away. And what happened is we started fighting. And we didn't walk out saying we're going to have a fight club, but just naturally, young men need to get that energy out. And I know you guys will agree with this. If, if we ever got to the point where they took high school football out of the public schools, uh, man, I just think it would be devastating for our country. So I want to stress the importance of football in our country. I think it's utterly important that these young men have these outlets and something to become a family and then get rid of that, that testosterone that's built up in especially adolescent males as they go through high school. So, Brian, uh, to get the book, uh, to follow us on Facebook, uh, if you search Rise of the Warriors on Facebook, you can like our page. We'll have updates and uh, we'll share stories. Um, you know, we're thinking about starting our own podcast and we'll get Coach Fricky on there. On Twitter, it's at ROTW2019. You can follow our handle on Twitter at ROTW2019. Then to order the book, you can go to our website. It's www.riseofthewarriorsbook.com. So it's rise of the warriors book.com and warriors is plural. Just add the word book at the end.com. You'll find uh, the cover is on the, the web page there, or you can just go to Amazon and search rise of the warriors, Mark Esch, E S C H. And it should pop up and you can order it on Amazon prime. If you don't, it's only available on Amazon. So if you're in the Caledonia area, you can swing in the smooth toe and pick it up. If you don't, if you're not on Amazon prime, you probably know somebody who's on Amazon prime, just have them order it for you and then pay them so you don't pay the shipping. So that's how you get it.